subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Print Soft Cover where today we examine a book that really peels back the layers of British rule in India. Now this is a topic that has colored Indian history and continues to influence Indian politics today. A Harper Collins publication. I have the book here with me. It's called Peace, Poverty and Betrayal. And today we have the book's very own author with us, Roderick Matthews, a freelance writer specializing in Indian history and politics. Roderick, thank you so much for uh, joining the print today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted so before... to be here. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, oh, thank you so okay. much for, for being here with us. But before we get into the book, um, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about your family links to India. I believe your great grandfather, in fact, tutor Jawaharlal Nehru. Yes, that's correct. Yes, and if well, you could tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Well, my my great great grand my great grandfather. He was my mother's. Um, mother's father um, joined the Indian Educational Service in the 1880s as a young tutor. This is very much what the what the British were doing. They were sending out very young people to the colonial education system, um, and he became a professor of uh, English at Patna University, which was established at the time. Then up the road. Uh, there was an institution called Muir Central College, which became Lahabad University. Mm -hmm. And he was transferred there and he eventually became principal of Muir College. And during that period, 1905 to 1912, um, he tutored, he didn't teach the young Nehru, um, but he he uh, he was sent for special lessons. This is the, we don't have documentary evidence, I have to say. Okay. Oh, the then. family legend is that he was g given extra cramming lessons to get him into Harrow. Okay. Because because Jawal went went to um, to Harrow School first, but they they remained friends. Uh, uh, he remained a friend of the family because the mother of the Maud Jennings, that that man was called um, uh, uh, George George James Jennings. His wife Maud Jennings was actually governess to the Nehru family. I see. For a while, um, uh, we don't know exactly the dates because again, there's no evidence. No documentary evidence, but they knew each other. And when Jawaharlal was at Cambridge, he used to cycle over to Oxford and, and stay with the family. Um, now, that's one side. That's because they lived in Allahabad. There's no other reason for that. That was just simply coincidence. Because, of course, at the time, Jawaharlal Nehru was, was no big deal. His father was Motilal, but um, he wasn't a big Congress figure in 1912 so much. I mean, he was, yes, he was an important player, but he was only one of many. Um, he emerged. <laughs> Hold on, so I'll just get rid of them. Hello? Hello, sorry, I'm actually just doing an interview with India. This is my mother. <laughs> uh, can I call you back? <laughs> Bye. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, the other side of the family, um, my uh, mother's, this is both on my mother's side, my mother's father's father was a politician, a liberal politician um, called Charles Roberts, mm -hmm. and he was Under Secretary of State for India in 1913-14, okay. and he got to know um, Mohandas Gandhi, when again he wasn't very famous, but he came to London from South Africa to meet Gokhale, and he got ill during that time, and my great-great-grandmother, great, great, my great -grandmother, um, Cecilia Roberts, um, looked after him and uh, took him <laughs> food and drink. <laughs> When he was in London, and uh, there's a story. It's it's in it's in the aut autobiography. It's in the experiments with truth mm -hmm. uh, uh, that she took him um, milk, powdered milk, and he said, "I can't eat, drink, you know, goats, uh, um, cow's milk because I'm uh, taking a vow to to only drink goat's milk, which is a vow he'd taken in South Africa." And she said, "Oh no, 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 this is this is powdered milk. It's different." And it, of course, it wasn't. It was something like it was malted mm -hmm. milk. It was something like Horlicks, what we would call Horlicks. And he made the the concoction and drank it and immediately realized it was cow's milk. So basically she made him break his vow, but oh. he was very generous about it. And it's all, it's all written. This again was family history for which there was no evidence. One day I was reading his experience with truth in the British library. And I just burst out laughing. I nearly got thrown out because this is actually, there's the story It's written in his own words and she's mm -hmm. mentioned by name. So that's two. Yes. I'm, you know, I'm part of putting together the Indian dream team. 
of Pharaoh <laughs> and family. Family. My, they are my, my mother's side of the family put together the dream team. They are. They say I can I can take all the credit. <laughs> Great. So uh, let's move on to the book. And um, I'll just explain my first thoughts actually while reading it. It's a fantastic book, I have to say, one that really challenges you, especially Thank if you're you. an Indian reader. Um, I found the book really overturned a lot of, you know, assumptions I had about Brit- about British India, and particularly the image of the British as um, this systematic force that had something in mind and was going after it, when in fact it was really a process of trial and error, yeah. and incompetence also yes. at times, yes. really That's incompetent. Cool. Yes. So. Yes. Um, this is a very dense read, it's about 400 pages, and it spans the period between 1600 to 1950. So it covers a wide, a wide range, of, range of events um, over a huge period of time. So um, the first part of the book, just for, so, uh, so our viewers know, the book is divided into three sections. The first section, uh, and Roger, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The first section is more of an in, in, like an overview. Yes, correct. Where you sort of introduce the binaries that you're going to tackle later, and you also tell us a little bit about you know um, uh, how British domestic politics sort of shaped the attitudes um, before the British British came to India. And I won't go into that because it is a little complicated with the Whigs and the Tories and things like that, but maybe we'll touch upon it later. Now, the second part of the book, which I feel is more the meat of the book, um, sort of, you know, retells the story, which is the title of it. And you really go um, almost three decades at a time, sometimes an entire century at a time, breaking down um, what the British did, how the East India Company, uh, the mandate changed very much so from just a commercial entity to one of governmental status. And in the final part, which is called retrospect, you really tie it all together. And, um, you know, uh, you give your own uh, opinion, as in your whole broad opinion about um, how this played out. So um, first off, I wanted to know how long have you been working on this book? What inspired you and what are the particular resources you used? Um, while writing it. Uh, bef- before I answer that, can I, can I pl- have a request, please, that I can have you every time? Because <laughs> that, that, you've completely understood what I was trying to do with the book. Um, there you are. Thank you. It's, thank it's, you. So, it's so common, I'm afraid, when people review a book, they read the first 20 pages and the last 20 pages. Yes. You, you've true. clearly... Um, you, you've clearly... away from that. I no. tried to. Yeah. No. Well, well done. Medal. I'll give you a medal for that. Thank you. Um, How did I do it? Well, I've been working on it a long time. I really got interested in Indian history to write about it in about 2007. I was asked to start writing for a website. Mm -hmm. And I did, for about three years, I did what would be like a crash course, like a degree course in Indian history. Uh, But I was being paid to write. So it was um, was quite interesting to do that. And I became really, really interested in the subject. In a way, I, I completely... It's completely surprised me. I had studied Indian history in very small quantity at university in the 70s, where we studied, um, it was a subject called politics and empire, a very interesting part of Eng- English politics, 1765, 1784, when a lot of things are happening, the it, Amer- loss of the American colonies, um, taking on government in India, taking on government in Canada, and various other parts of the world, you know, things are going on. It's too early for Australia and New Zealand. But there are things going on everywhere. And that really, early on, implanted in my head a connection between Indian history and English politics. And I think if you don't have that, you don't really understand. You just see these people keep arriving as faceless people. You don't understand that they were different, like exactly as you said. Um, There was incompetence, there was incoherence, there was, uh, um, you know, hand-to-mouth management, uh, you know, improvisation, all sorts of things going on. But behind that, there were two basic lines of thoughts, like you say, Whigs and Tories. Um, And this really affected the way that certain British people wanted to see Indians, like some Indians, the Liberals, the 
the Whigs, were much keener to interfere in Indian in society, whereas the Tories would just say, no, no, no. And they, But that's an exact parallel with what was happening in England. The Tories were, were doing exactly the same thing, as they are to this day, saying, leave the processes of society, let it, let the natural rulers rule, let the cream rise to the top, let people make money, let's leave everything alone. Whereas the liberals to this day would say, no, 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 we've got to adjust society. It's unjust. There's these injustices. We need to get into it. You know, so that's where it started. Um, the resources I used was was uh, 20 years of re uh, 15 years of solid reading. Now, I had, just to give myself a little medal here. I wrote the book after I decided what I thought. I didn't write the book having decided what I thought and then read things to support it, which is a very, very common intellectual fallacy to decide what you want. It's called confirmation bias to decide what you think and then go look for evidence for it. I didn't do that. My first book on India, which, and you should really, if you, I know it's asking a favor, yes, yes, which is also a Harper Collins book, but, um, that was my first attempt to understand what was going on in India, because the more and more I read about Indian history, first of all, every account I read was clearly biased. Secondly, when you actually looked at British policy, a lot of it didn't really make a lot of sense. They were doing different things in the North and the South. They were doing different things with the rich and the poor. They were doing different things one year and another year. So it, that didn't make any sense to me. And I was trying to work this out. And then, of course, the penny finally drops. Ah, they didn't know what they were doing. You know, um, they would. But the, the, the point then is, well, why did they hold on to India? You know, because you can come up with this whole idea of plundering and racism and Christian mission. And it, well, no, they got hold of India pretty much by accident, not 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 without deliberation along the way. But it was not planned. It was more of an accident than it was planned. But mm. once the situation started going, defense, defense, preemption, preemption, you have to expand. Empires expand. If they don't expand, they tend to be falling apart. And that's pretty much what the, the, the British just carried on until they reached the borders of India, because that was the safest thing to do. And they had the money and the wherewithal to do it. So um, uh, the, 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 the narrative of, of what the empire was about, um, uh, uh, it's, it becomes, you have to try to understand why the administrative systems were put in place as they were. Um, it, this this became really interesting to me during the flaws in the jewel period, and I read a lot of British memos and internal correspondence. And it's very clear if you do that that they they were they were pretty much making it up as they went along. And then if you put in this little pendulum back in British politics of kind of more progressive, more conservative, it all makes much more sense. Um, the real kernel of all of this is that it was there was a geostrategic point about holding India. Once the British had got India, which they didn't particularly want to do, and there was a lot of argument all along saying, don't, don't do this. It's, it's drawing us it's into a war. Yeah, we, yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to be involved in this. Why can't we just trade? You know, the point was that once India had fallen into British hands, it's a, there's a geostrategic imperative to keep it because if you don't keep it, the French are going to get it. Or if it's not the French, it's the Russians are going to get it. If it's not the Russians, it's the Japanese who are going to get it. So there's always a reason to keep India. And it's not exactly a political reason. It's not an ideological reason. It's much more practical. Also, I just want to make out that during the flaws in the jewel research, I realised the British didn't actually make that much money out of India. That's why the geostrategic um, mm -hmm. imperative is the important understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm pleased, and I know that that's why I like some of the things you said about um, overturning what you've um, uh, come to know, because the other thing is I'm not aligned politically in Britain, and I'm not aligned politically in India. So I was, I tried to be open minded about this. And I realized that, you know, if you read imperial history, well, guess what, the British are the heroes. If you read Indian nationalist history, guess what, the Indian nationalists are the heroes. Um, if you read Hindutva history, well, you know, we know the rest. But, uh, and I'm not going to subscribe to any of those uh, schools of history. I'm going to say I'm coming after this. I tried to write a readable book for an, not an unbiased person, everybody's a bit biased, but for someone who maybe didn't know a lot about India, not a specialist, but something that was readable, 
I know you said it's a dense read. It's not that dense. It's, there's a lot in it, I'd like to say, rather than it was There's a, a lot in it, but I wouldn't say the language is dense, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, the, uh, there's a lot to get through because um, if you just write a narrative history, this happened, this happened, this happened, that's called a chronicle, and mm. it's it, it, it's baffling. It's just a, it's just a just go past like that, like names, like, you know, credits at the end of a film. You know, doesn't make any sense to you. It's, there's no plan to it. You know, the film has a plot. The credits don't have a plot. So that was my my view to try to write a, a, a coherent story. The other thing is that there are some very good books written about sections of Indian history. Um, I'm a great admirer of a lot of writers of Indian history and, and some not so. But um, what they tend to do is, is they concentrate on one thing. But uh, if you start in 1918 and say, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, we're starting the history of partition from 1918. Well, you say, well, why in 1918 have we got the Lucknow Pact and why have we got this? So, of course, you know, it's like my children say to me when they, this is the kind of person I am, that uh, when they would ask me something, I would say, well, and then they got used to saying, yeah, we know, it goes back to Babylonia. Yeah, we know. <laughs> you know? And so, because all of my explanations tend to go back to Adam and Eve or the Mesopotamians or something. Mm. So um, I kind of wanted to do that with British India to say, well, let's at least start at the beginning mm. and not shirk. I, I do get through it fairly quickly, um, dear viewer. You know, it's, I don't go year by year. But if you don't understand how it started, you know, because every bit, every bit in history leads to the next bit, leads to the next bit. You know, that's an academic view. You say you shouldn't periodize your history and make it too period specific. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't relate to kings. It shouldn't relate to centuries, artificial dates. So I tried to say, all right, let's just start with the first expedition to India, which actually arrives in India in 1608. But the formation of the, the incorporation, the charter of the East India Company, the first East India, Com East India Company is 1600. And then 1950, I chose as an end date because that is the, the, the time India was finally declared as a republic, it had elected its own head of state by then. And also that uh, Nehru had said, we're not coming in the Commonwealth if the king is the king of the Commonwealth. Well, I'm going to come into the Commonwealth. If you stop calling it the British Commonwealth and you stop calling yourself king, you can, it can be the Commonwealth and you can be the head. Right. I think that's actually a terrific achievement of his because it's, you know, as I say, it's one of the last things in the book. You know, India, this great land of princes and absolute rulers and monarchy, mm -hmm. in the end, dissolved the greatest monarchical structure the world had ever seen which was the british empire there you are that's that's a little indian tick at the end of it um so, so that was it does that does that answer any of those questions uh, look i can talk for hours no, about no, it stuff, so stop, me. stop me but i Ask think should, else. i i will pick up on one thing you said about okay. how you disagreed with a lot of indian scholars a lot of indian writers as you do in the book very um openly yeah, uh, yeah. One person, of course, that you uh, previously also countered is Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who's a member <laughs> of parliament and part of the Congress party. Yes, and yes. you actually criticize his um, book that came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called India, the Future is Now. And I'll just be quoting from your book, actually. You call Tharoor's book a good read, but a bad book. That is shrill with righteous indignation. It plays little or no concern for balance and is open to a wide range of criticisms, including an unblushing taste for absurdity. More seriously, Tharoor eliminates Indians from the story almost entirely, except as victims. For him, Britain's inglorious Indian empire had no rich Indians in it. So this is actually something that you talk about at length in the book about how um, there was an elite class of Indians, rich, powerful Indians who um, were complicit in, you know, allowing um, the British to take, you know, uh, allowing the British to veer into India. And uh, you also bring up how they didn't participate in the 1857 revolt. And that's a key point as well. So, um, oh, well, those are that, slightly different people, but yes, go on. Right. So, uh, coming back to what you said about Tharu's, you know, uh, perception or maybe exclusion of Indians from the larger narrative, do you think that he exaggerates Indian victimhood or are Indians not victims at all? Um, no, Indians certainly victims, um, but Indians are victims of the British and of their own ruling class. 
um, is what I would say. I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on sort of personal attacks on Dr. Toro. He's, uh, he's a great man and he's a, um, a class performer. I've seen him speak, but he's really doing the kind of stirring people up thing. He's making people angry. He's designed, he, the book is designed to make you angry. It, he confused, constantly confuses the British and the East India Company. He, can't, he, he refuses to um, engage with with any kind of systematic um, analysis of what actually happened. He just kind of cherry picks all the bits that make you angry. And, and elsewhere, in the, I mean, I've got a copy of the book here. It's not actually that one. It's in, in Britain, it was called Inglorious Empire. I see. Um, and I've got a book there uh, and uh, it's covered in red pen marks where I'm going, no, you, you would never get away with that in a universe. If you put that even up as a school essay, you would you would be schooled on it. People would say, "How do you say, how do you know that? Why have you not distinguished between this? Why have you not mentioned that?" Um, so he, no, I think there's quite a lot of um, of, of glossing over. He, he's he, it's it's a narrative. He's he's come up with this idea. The British arrived, smashed everything up, looted everything, went home. Um, you know, and this is just not right. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, the British took economic power for themselves. Definitely, that's in you know we can come back to the title of the book eventually. You know, but um, the British took economic power for themselves and they took political power for themselves. There wasn't much internal political power in India that anybody could share. Remember this, India was not a democracy when Britain arrived. You know, Thoreau sort of says, oh, well, we were about to get a constitutional monarchy through the Marathas who were bound to give away all their power that they'd fought so hard for. No, I mean, that's the unblushing taste for absurdity that, that somehow the Marathas were going to turn into um, Whigs. You know, no, sorry, they weren't. Uh, they, were, they were extremely skillful warriors and, and not quite the villains that the British made them out to be. There's good British scholarship to show that they weren't. But they were, why, would, why on earth would they turn themselves into constitutional monarchs? Why on earth did the rest of India fight back against them so hard? You know, that's always the problem within India, that, that when any one region came up, the others all, you know, it's the same thing that happened in Europe. Um, you know, if I want to say something controversial, I'd say something like the British did for India, what Napoleon tried to do for Europe. Um, which is basically knock everybody over and um, and impose some kind of uniformity of system. Um, you know, the Brit Europeans are still arguing about this. Look at it. And mm. the Indians aren't. So, yeah, let's just leave it, leaving Toro aside. Um, like I say, it's a great read. It's a rollicking good read. It's designed for Indians. And it, and it's and it tapped into a certain um, anti-colonial, anti-imperial, post-imperial thing that's going on here at the moment. Um, I think the book sold very much better over here than it did in India. And I don't want, and the book, my book is not a reply just to Taror. Of course. Um, it's, it's really, it's really um, a way of, uh, I just mentioned him because if you don't mention him, it's a bit like you're, you know, you've, you've mm -hmm. elephant in the room kind of thing, you know, that, that, that um, he's put up a very strong case for, well, look, he's a Congress politician and he's spouted out what is essentially the cliches of, of, of Congress history. He, he pretty much admits so himself. That speech, which he gave at the Oxford Union, which is great fun, is basically just all the cliches of Congress history put in a row. One of which is this divide and rule thing, for instance, which um, I know Indians get taught this at school. They get taught that um, Akbar was a great man and sorted everything out. Aurangzeb was a bad man and then everything that put things wrong. Then the British arrived, they set the... Muslims against the Hindus, and then they uh, messed about with everybody, and they, they partitioned these inevitable consequence, and then they left, divide and quit, wreck the place in an act of vengeance and um, peak. Um, mm. I, I was trying to sort of touch on that lightly, saying that that is a very biased form of uh, view, because what actually happened was that from the moment the British put their well, it was the English first, but then the British. But when they set foot on the quayside on any Indian port, loads of people came straight up to them and said, I can be your interpreter, I can be your agent, you know, and the Dubashes and the Banyans, and they, they all appeared. And why not? You know, and Tarur, I've heard Tarur dismiss these people. Oh, they are the comprador class, which is a Marxist term for people who make money out of, you know, colonial systems. But yes, the compradors were certainly there. But what happened was that the British got so deeply into the land system, the land holding system. This is really important to understand. The British took economic power and political power, but they left social power with the elite. They, they tinkered with it a little bit sati and, you know, conversion. maybe a little. That all stopped after 1857. 
and the landlords in India were left in charge. Mm. Um, and although the British are obsessed with tenant, this is one of the incoherences of British policy, that they backed the landlords politically, in other words, they needed their support, but they backed the peasants tenants, economically. economically, because that's right, they protected them um, against tenants, against eviction. Now, this is this was the British, for humanitarian reasons, denying to Indian landlords the power they'd held over their own peasants, which was to clear them off the land in the 18th century, reform the holdings, change the agricultural system and push everybody into the cities. Now, that's what benefited Britain, and India was never allowed that. The British could not bear the idea that they'd arrived in this country and that the peasants would be worse off or somehow thrown off the land. So they tried so hard. They tried creating a zamindar class in Bengal with the permanent settlement. They tried to create a yeoman tenant class in the, in the Monroe system, in the Bandras presidency, and then they tried it again in the Punjab. They tried again and again to, to create these loyal classes. Um, so the, 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 the whole Tarawood narrative is really on a completely different level. I'm really looking at, at saying, well, what happened? Why were the British drawn into the Indian land system? It's because it made money. Because if you went, went to Canada and there's only the Inuit, or you go to Australia and there's only the Aboriginals, there's no rent, there's no money. Whereas in India, they had a very, very highly sophisticated, long developed system of land holding, which involved money. So, and, and the Indian landlords, the Indian princes, let's call them princes and landlords, you know, landholders, the elites, were using the Europeans in the 1740s to fight their battles for them by giving them land holdings. So the British were, and the French were immediately drawn into holding land. Now, the British stopped. The British never took land for themselves. The only real movement in land holding that happened in India during the British power from 1757 onwards was actually um, a consolidation of slightly larger land holdings. And I think that shows you politically why the British succeeded. This is what I call oblige and rule, because you will always find in the Congress view of history that it's, it's Gandhi wrote it, Nehru wrote it, that everything was fine, but the British set Indians against each other in all sorts of different ways. And in fact, I don't think they did. I, I'm not really sure that's right at all, because I wrote quite a long section, which I cut down in the, in the eventual book, because it was too long, of all the reasons why I think this is not a correct historical analysis. Um, in fact, the British were trying to... Um, uh, um, cultivate support. If you look at the British, instead of looking at looting and oppression and all these kind of, which, which I admit you can certainly feel that from the other side, but if you look at it from the British political side, they were constantly desperately trying to find ways to create a legitimate power in India. That's why I talk about the so British. That they could say uh, that we're a legitimate imperial power. So yes. Imperative yes. That yes. And this, if you like, is is the great British flaw, one of the great flaws in British policy, that they thought that justifying colonial rule to themselves was pretty much all they needed to do. Because if you already think by by the 18th century, the British thought they had the greatest constitution in the world. And they thought we have solved all the political problems in the world because we have the parliamentary system and we have peace and you know tolerance and we don't kill each other now. You can retire from politics alive. That's one of the great gains of the 18th century that the British stopped killing each other over mm -hmm. politics. Once you've done that, you say, well, we have the perfect system. And if we monitor each other over what we do in India, then we know it's all right. So they kidded themselves. This this is, if you like, the, the, the ground... Of, of imperialism, not, not the racial superiority stuff that comes later. Mm. It's actually this earlier stuff where you say, well, we have a better system. The Indians are better off being ruled by us because we're monitoring each other than by being ruled by each other, where they just kill each other. And then you have another prince and another prince and another war and another war. So they, they, they drew themselves into this. This is what I'm saying, again, about Tarur and the rich Indians, that he kind of assumes that, that all this depredation is going on. Nobody in India had any money. Well, you know, he doesn't mention Dwakanath Tadgor, for instance, you know, doesn't mention that all of the fate fortunes that were made in Bombay in the 19th century, some of them, the Parsi community and, and others, the mill, the mill owners in, uh, in, in Bombay who made a fortune, who made fortunes, large fortunes. Um, he doesn't mention any of those. They're just, just, they're just not present in the book. So you can't really say this is a balanced account. 
So would okay. you sort of argue is that this section, this, um, you know, the higher echelons of Indian society, they did have a role to play when the British came to India. And I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you asked two broad questions. One, how is it that the British British stayed in India, ruled over oh. India for so long? Yeah. How did they do that? Did they do it alone? Probably not. And, and two, um, you know, how is it that modern India still has, you know, key tenets of uh, what the British uh, introduced, whether it's yeah. sport, whether it's tea, yeah. whether it's forms yeah. of government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so how did you, so would you say that these are the two premises of the book or the two big questions that sort of like drove your research? Yeah, well, it's, it was, there was more thinking than pure research. I can't claim that the book is based on original research, and I'm sure I will get torn to pieces by people in the Indian press saying, this is all on secondary sources, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's a popular history. It's meant for ordinary people, but it does have an intellectual um, substructure, which a lot of popular history doesn't have, like Tarot. There's no substructure to that. That's just trotting out Congress history. Um, or there's some others who I won't mention, who kind of trot out, um, who kind of get, all right, I'll mention one, um, William Dalrymple and the and the idea that somehow the East India Company was the progenitor of all capitalist greedy people in the world. Um, that That's what you'd call in, in news, you'd call that a news peg. You know, you're trying to, I mean, Dalrymple says, you know, Google, Mobile, Exxon, you know, Enron, uh, Walmart, you know, you can trace it all back to the EIC. That's, that's, that's not really respectable history. That's popular history of another kind. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to write a book which has an intellectual underpinning. You know, you must understand, for instance, it's 1600, the East orient and the west were, were roughly equivalent in intellectual and technological achievement something happened in the 17th century and europe eased ahead that's why europe had the colonial empire so the chinese and the indians didn't colonize the rest of the world it was the europeans that did europe stole a market on the rest of the world britain stole a march on the rest of europe that's why the british end up in india you know and then within the british um polity you have this form of of, of whiggism which is, which is a way of, it's not democratic, it's pre-democratic. It mm. leads to liberalism, but it's not liberalism. It's the idea that elites should be included in the political process as opposed to monarchs. And mm. then the elite should monitor itself. Now, um, this, if you start with that intellectual underpinning, you can't then write this kind of tra-la-la-la history um, uh, uh, that 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 uh, sort of trips off the tongue. You have to take it a little bit more seriously. You have to look at the plot holes. This is one of the things. You know, yes, you're right. Those two things that I asked: Why did British rule last so long? Could it have lasted so long without some cooperation within India? Well, probably no, because what, twelve hundred civil servants and a few hundred soldiers, or or a few thousand, compared to one hundred and eighty million people. Well, clearly, you know, the British got hold of the levers of social power, not directly the themselves, but they put the bite on or obliged um, the land, uh, land earning classes. Now, admittedly, they kept an eye on them, you know, and for instance, but when um, they left all the princes, they could have, they could have knocked over all the princely states in India one by one. They had the power to do it and they didn't do it. Prudentially, they didn't. Prudentially, they didn't invade Nepal. Prudentially, they didn't take Bhutan. So they weren't just greedy, warmongering, bloodthirsty racists. You know, they they were prudential people who were making calculations. After 1857, they decided they would completely leave the princely states alone. This I call the first partition, mm -hmm. because you basically treated India in two halves, that you have the, the British administered half, which will have certain types of laws and certain types of government. And then you have princely India. Princely India was left entirely to itself on three conditions, you know, that they didn't combine with each other, that they that they ruled well, they didn't have private armies, you know, and, and that was it apart from, and when they stepped out of line, bad government, you know, they would, they were then admonished. But instead of like Dalhousie did before 1857, they would replace someone like the Nawab of Awad. Um, they just replaced, they just said, no, well, you're not suitable. Um, we'll have your son or we'll have your cousin or we'll have your whoever, you know, we'll appoint someone um, we'll, with your consent and then we'll leave you in, in, in charge. Now, that if that's not oblige and rule, I don't know what is. You know, that's not divide and rule. 
that is keeping the peace. The great standard, the, you know, the gold standard of British rule was peace, orderliness, peace. Who does that benefit? The existing ruling classes. There is a conservative alliance after 1857. Mm -hmm. Before 1857, I agree that's different because the British were allying with, they were trying to create new classes, zamindars, yeomanry, you know, riots in, in other parts of India. Um, uh, they were trying to create these new classes and uh, the urban bourgeoisie, and it didn't go very well. None of these people quite lived up to, to their expectations. The urban bourgeoisie didn't turn on the British in 1857, but the British turned on them afterwards, didn't reward them for their loyalty. That's the, the first betrayal in the book. The second betrayal is of the ruling classes when the British left. They, 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 they betrayed the, the, the princes. They just said, no, you can, we'll leave you to sound up a tail and just, just leave you. Um, so, you know, I am trying to be balanced in this. I'm not taking the British side. I'm trying to see this. Yes, first of all, how did the British last so long? Because they made alliances. They tried to create new classes. They tried to create alliances. The same thing I'm saying, the search for support, which I call the search for legitimacy. If you can persuade people to support you, then that's a legitimate form of government by the British Whiggish, you know, consent of the governed kind of idea. The other plot hole is why didn't the Indians, if there are 180 million Indians who are so united by, you know, in the way that Gandhi and Nehru said, this spiritual, this deep unity, national unity, Mukherjee in 1909 is talking about the fundamental unity of India, you know, all of this. Why, why, why weren't the Indians able to push the British out? They could have pushed them out in an afternoon. Why didn't they? The plot hole, plot, movie plot hole, two big plot holes there. And the way they usually filled up is, Indians say, oh, the British were savage and, you know, imperialist and the, and the Indians and then British say, ah, oh, the Indians were divided. Um, so you have to take a, um, a, a look at the longer narrative and try to, to look for those plot holes. And my book is trying to heal those a bit by being more realistic and less partisan and trying to look at people in terms of self-interest instead of these bogus, you know, imperialism was never an ideology. It was, it never had a fixed meaning. There's no fixed text. Imperialism never told anybody what they should be doing because it was, it was different in lots of different cases. There are lots of conflicts of interest within imperialism. Are you trying to raise money in India by tax, ta uh, by tariffs to pay for the government of India? Well, when you do that, the cotton growers in Lancashire go mad. So you've got a con conflict of interest. You can't run the empire on imperialism. It doesn't work. It's not an ideology. It's, it's a pragmatic acceptance of, of British superiority and ways of trying to support British, uh, continued British dominance. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's case by case. It's not an ideology. So, all right, uh, where did, where did I, uh, I'm going on too much. Sorry. I, I love no this. No worries. We have I'm, about 10 minutes most... left. So I'm going to squeeze in two questions. Yeah, please. please. Indian, but, history um, is the, Indian history is the most interesting subject in the world. There you go. I go agree. On. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I just wanted to finish your thought on, um, you know, how the British made alliances in India. Mm. And in one part um, of your book, uh, you say the British can take some, but not all the credit um, for successfully ruling India, at least for two centuries. And that, you know, rich, powerful Indians played a role. How then do we approach the idea of reparations? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't addressed that issue. Um, uh, I. I. Pardon. You got me there. Um, I haven't. I haven't thought that one through. Mm -hmm. I. The, you know, British do give foreign aid to India, despite the fact that India is sending rockets to the moon and people in this country are outraged by that. To this day, you'll find people in Parliament standing, why are we sending aid to Indians? And the, the, you can call that um, reparations if you like. Um, what do you want? <laughs> How much? You know, <laughs> do we, the, the trouble with reparations we is... We want the Kohinoor diamond. Well, all right. Now, you can't have that. Because, well, you can. But uh, on the same basis that everything else is divided, you can have 80%, 81%, and Pakistan can have 19%. Is that mm -hmm. okay? We'll chop uh. it up. <laughs> the thing is, if, we get, if we give the coin oil back to you, no, you can't sell it. It doesn't no, make no, India no. richer. Or you know, it didn't make India poorer when it left. It's a diamond. It's a gem. I mean, no, I, yeah. know, I, you know, I, I, I would, uh, uh, yes, for, for foreign aid, whatever, um, uh, 
Britain could now be more welcoming to India's on foreign visas. But we have our political people here who, you know, it's not called Hindutva, it's called something else in England. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, they don't like having foreigners coming in. So I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say, yes, let's have this uh, legendary uh, free trade deal if you want one. Um, you know, if there's anything, I think the Koinor is a bit of a problem. No, uh, for sure. I meant that as a joke. Sure. I know you did, but <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good joke. Um, uh, no, I, I don't, you know, I think Shashi Tarua said uh, you would be uh, happy with one pound a year in perpetuity, and I would willingly pay that myself. So there you go. And lastly, um, just for our viewers, you know, who I, I, I definitely recommend this book. This is one you should not miss because it really challenges you, especially if you're an Indian reader. So um, I watched a 27 interview of yours uh, where you um, said in your first book, uh, Flaws of the Jewel, you were polite. <laughs> and yes. in your second book, Jinnah versus Gandhi, yes. you were neutral. Yes. So what's your tone in this book? <laughs> well, I, it, the only people I'm really attacking, I'm not attacking Indians. I love Indians. I love India. Um, I'm not attacking Indians at all. I'm attacking some of the tacky historians who've who've latched onto this subject and distorted it there's been some terrible popular history written again i'll have to mention william dalrymple whose work is so sloppy and full of mistakes um i could give you lists but you know it, it sounds petty if i do um um Taro's book is not a not a great um uh, uh ornament to indian scholarship you know someone like um Jadana sarkar would absolutely be spinning in his grave sumit sarkar wrote a very good book 1885 India, modern India or something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not against that at all. I'm um, uh, Ram Chandra Gua, has um, written a very good uh, book after 90, uh, post, um, you know, Gandhi onwards. Um, so, no, the people I'm really getting at are the, are the kind of trashy, uh, superficial um, people who, who are writing history to wind people up. I would, I, that book there is trying to find some middle ground so you can read that and move on to other things if you like. But I hope it will leave you with enough imprint in your mind about how you don't have to be shouting from the rooftops about this stuff. There's a very interesting human interaction went on between uh, Britain and, and India, which, is, which was productive for both cultures. I do list things in the book, which I think are, are, are part of that exchange. And yes, all right, cricket, you know, it, it, currently India is, is taking cricket to, to new places. That's part of the ongoing exchange. Um, I, there are all sorts of things. You know, the, the, the fact that British cuisine has completely changed in the last 30, 40 years, it's almost entirely to do with the taste for Indian food. So it, I'm really not trying to pick fights here. The only thing I'm trying to do is level out some of the distortions that get introduced into, by people writing books with, um, I don't know, what could I say, less than optimum motivations. Right. I'm probably in really bad trouble now. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so, uh, my last question. Um, oh, you, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> um, you talk about manipulated statistics um, when we talk about uh, British colonial rule, when mm. we talk about, you know, before the British came, oh, yeah. the British, mm. after they came, after the plunder, so on and mm. so forth. Mm. We were this poor. We were this, um, yeah. you know, uh, completely uh, desolate. Yes, uh, yes. And one particular statistic is that in uh, the 1700s, um, you know, uh, India generated 23% of the world's wealth. Well, and then in 1947, it was 3%. 3%, yeah. yeah. So, I know how you count it in the book. Would you like to tell our viewers yeah, okay. how you I'll, counted I'll, it? I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you what I can. First of all, this is a very misleading statistic because India had 23% of the world's wealth, but it also had 23% of the world's population because the world's wealth in 1700 was based on agricultural production. Um, Europe had about 25%. China had about 25%. That changed over the next 200 years because of industrialization and mechanization. The output per head of population changed in the West. India was not depredated. India was not destroyed. India was outstripped, outinvested. And the British can take a good deal of blame for this, for not investing in because India. They deprived India. But it they, wasn't that they stole. 
No, because the amount, look, uh, India's wealth was primarily, apart from the Koinor, India's wealth was primarily agriculture. You can't shift all of that to England. Where did it go? It stayed in India. Even when the British were taxing Indians, they were spending it on, up to 50% of government revenue on the army. Who was in the army? Indians. What were the what were they eating? Indian food. You know, it's not this this idea that the there was this, you know, Dadabai Naraji came up with this whole drain theory, which is very, very convincing, but actually not particularly accurate economically. I'm not defending the British here. I page after page in the in the book I say the British fall short on this. They didn't do that. They, you know, they did this that was harmful. I've, it's full of condemnations and criticism of British imperial rule in India. But the idea that 23% of world GDP goes to 3% means that 20% of the world's GDP went to in, to England or something like that. The, 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 you don't see the other graph. The world's GDP absolutely rocketed. But India fell behind on a per capita basis because India remained an agricultural country because that suited the British Empire because India was never deliberately made poor. This is part of the poverty strand in the book. India be, remained poor, if you like, because it remained an, in, a, 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 an agricultural um, nation. The reason the British never needed it to do any more than that, British needed India to have a trade surplus with the whole of the rest of the world, but to have a trade deficit with Britain. That was the engine that made the whole... I've, I, I haven't put too much of it into the book because it's quite complicated and, and it makes my head spin as well. But financing the Raj is a very, very complicated idea with the... And it massively helped the city of London, largely at the expense of India, absolutely. But India was not impoverished. If India was impoverished, the British Empire would have fallen. It would have had no money and no cash flow. So mm -hmm. India had a big surplus with its trading partners in Asia. But that, that surplus was then guided back into Britain. The actual amount of money that was taken directly was very small. It, 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 people talk about the home charges, which was the things that the British government of India charged to Indians, things like military uh, pensions and certain kinds of um, uh, procu military procurement that was bought mm -hmm. at abroad, stores and procurement. It was called the home charges. And people ramped this up to an enormous amount. But in fact, you know, a, a man called Dasgupta, in India, um, has calculated it was less than 0.5% of GDP. So, um, you know, you can throw these statistics around. You know the old thing about economists, get five economists in a room, you'll get six opinions. You know, economists were invented to make astrologers look good, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can get plenty of uh, meat out of these <laughs> statistics if you want to. No, that's my point, that it was not a direct transfer of wealth. It was a, a disparity of scale. And the British did not invest in India because they didn't need to mm. and they couldn't find a way of doing it i mean the british did try to make indian agriculture more efficient in all sorts of ways they tried all sorts of incentives and jiggling around with the system and it never really worked now and and again just to bring it one thing i would also like to say to myself about myself is that i'm one of the few people who've written about the whole of british india who've also written about modern studied modern india so i my knowledge doesn't stop at 1947 or 1950 mm -hmm. it does go on and i know that india still has a chronic agricultural problem because agriculture is still overmanned that's one of the problems there are too many people who are not efficient enough per, you know, the holdings are too small, the investment's too small, the government pours money into agriculture to basically buy votes, you know, politicians buy votes from, from the rural, because so many of the people in India still live in the country in a democracy where the votes are, that's where the power is, that's where the money goes. So the British didn't have, the British problem was different, but agriculture in India is really difficult and the British never solved it. And that's why India had 3%. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, also, the idea that India went from 23% to 3% implies that the economy shrank, but it didn't. It actually uh, trebled in size in the same period, yeah. which is not yeah. enough because the British economy double, uh, uh, increased by a lot more. But it, India was outstripped, not just plundered. That, mm -hmm. that, that's, again, it, it, sorry, uh, you, want, you want brief answers, but it, it's, it's easy to manipulate this stuff. And it, it it's not at least have that, that, the that you have a balance. From you should have a balance. In discussing this, you should have a balance. And there mm -hmm. you go. I'm not excusing the British, but I'm saying that using those statistics and the way that they're used is borderline fraudulent.
Roderick Matthews, thank you so much for taking out the time. I had a really pleasant time speaking to you. And thank you. I very much enjoyed it. Peeling back this book and trying to understand the misconceptions about British India. Um, thank you so much once again and take care. Thank you, Pia. Thank you. Bye-bye.